Hello, and welcome to an, another episode of Containers from the Couch. My name is Jeremy Cowan. I am the manager uh, for developer advocacy for uh, Amazon EKS. And joining me today are a couple of guests. Uh, Shane, would you like to introduce yourself first? Absolutely. Hey, gang, my name's Shane. I'm a performance uh, zealot and enthusiast. Uh, I go all around the world troubleshooting uh, some of the largest kind of uh, performance stuff at uh, AWS. And uh, excited to be here, Jeremy. Great. Thanks, Shane. And we're also joined today by Natan Yellen. Uh, Natan, you want to tell us a little about yourself and what Robusta does? Yeah. So uh, thank you for having me. So I've done that journey of going from a developer to a founder. And uh, in a previous life, I wrote that I with all level code and um, probably didn't do as much performance related stuff as Shane, um, but dabbled in it now and then when it came up on the job. And um, what Robusta does is we're essentially an observability, observability platform for Kubernetes. And we take your existing Prometheus and we help extract the actual insights for what you should be looking at in your existing Prometheus data. And we do that with a live stuff that's open source as well as an enterprise platform. Great. And uh, today we're going to be talking about an, an open source solution that uh, you and the other folks at Robusta created called uh, KRR and how you could uh, use that to optimize the resources that are assigned to containers. Um, I thought a good place to start uh, would be to describe um, the differences between KRR and the vertical pod autoscaler, because it seems like uh, there are a lot of similarities between the two um, in that they're both attempting to um, adjust the uh, the resources, the CPU and memory that's uh, allocated to uh, containers. Um, so what are, what are the primary differences between uh, KRR and VPA? So I'll start with what's similar, okay? We're, we're both out to solve what's a really big problem for a lot of people in 2023, which is that everyone cares about cost. And yet when you look at Kubernetes clusters on average, and there's some really good data about this from Sysdig, then 69% of all the CPU that's been allocated in Kubernetes clusters is unused, which means that people are overpaying by 69% for compute. Um, and I'm not saying now, um, it, do, like, don't, you need to set aside the right resources, but you might be setting aside a lot of stuff for compute where you should, would be better setting aside, like, to get nodes with more memory, for example, right? Or maybe you really care about cost saving and you want to cut back on the cost saving altogether. Um, so I think to really understand that though, and to also understand what we're doing with KRR and what we're doing with the VPA, um, it, then you have to understand like how it's possible for on the one hand to have a cluster that's running at let's say 20% utilization. And on the other hand, how at the same time, you have a weird situation where you often have these clusters where pods are impending. And those two things seem contradictory. Like you have these bunch of pods that are impending and it says there isn't enough room in your cluster. And on the other hand, your cluster is running at like 10% utilization, 20% utilization of CPU. And the reason why is there's this one number in Kubernetes, really two numbers that are critical for getting utilization under control and running a cluster efficiently. Just two numbers. That's the CPU request and the memory request. Those are the only two numbers that matter when it looks like when you look at Kubernetes efficiency. And it all comes down to getting those two numbers right. And there are two common tools that people use to do that. So the first tool is the VPA. And then the second tool is KRR, the Kubernetes resource recommender that we wrote. And the interesting thing is we didn't want to write it. <laughs> we actually wanted to take what we heard from like a lot of our customers is, okay, I have stuff that's inefficient. I have a cluster here with like 20% utilization, right? I have something there that I want to fix. And can I take like the data from the VPA or can I take like this data and then can I know how to fix it? And when we started looking at that, then we actually built, started building a prototype where we took the data from the VPA. For people who don't know, the VPA is an open source project um, that does this. And we took the data from the VPA and we tried to just build like really good reporting capabilities. So like you get notified in Slack, like if there was um, a diff that was too big, right? We were running with the wrong app resource allocations. And what we discovered really fast was that we actually couldn't do the sort of stuff that we wanted to do on top of the VPA. So now I want to go and I want to answer your question about what the differences are. So the VPA um, it doesn't do data from Prometheus. What it does is it uh, uses the metrics API in Kubernetes and it's taking data in every single moment in time and then 
doing some calculations. So when you start with an API, then there's a that. You have to wait now until it gathers enough data. Whereas with the robot, our philosophy for KRI, and for all the other stuff we do, and I apologize about the annoying flickering in the background. That's fluorescence that I don't control. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, so what we do with um, it, then what we do with Robusta is we say, okay, you already have Prometheus, right? Most people already do. You already have this historical data, at least two weeks for a normal um, cluster with the default retention period. And so like, why not look at that and give you a recommendation for the CPU and memory right now? And then that has some interesting implications also for some VPA. So it means that we can give you a recommendation immediately. It means that we can give you a recommendation without needing to install a single thing in your cluster, right? Just run a local command line tool, point at Prometheus, it runs some numbers, calculates it, and it tells you. It means that we can use different algorithms and then you can like see which algorithm is fast, right? Because you're not just giving a recommendation like based on one thing that you're pulling in the store, like every point in time. So you're not configuring up front, so you have more flexibility after the fact to change the recommendations and to look at the algorithm. Um, so that's the first core cool difference in that we're tapping this historical Prometheus data. Um, and then the second core difference is I think we have a little bit more aggressive of a scope here in what we're trying to do. If you look at it, and I think I'll let Shane chi maybe chime in here on why this is true. If you look at it, then to get these really good like utilization, to get stuff out under control and to have good performance and good utilization still be reliable, then you really have to look at more than CPU and memory. You have to look at all this other stuff. And you can't just say, I'm going to give you a CPU request. And then a different person is going to go off and use a different algorithm. By algorithm, I mean, we're going to look at some graphs in your phone and make a decision. Um, and they're going to use a different algorithm to determine the HPI and how you horizontally scale, right? And then they're going to use something totally different to determine how to set up their node pool. You can't take all these different things and calculate each one separately and then expect to have an optimal result. So our goal with the Kubernetes resource recommender is to do what the name says and to give you one single tool that looks at the holistic picture um, for what your request should be. Eventually, we don't do this yet, but we're working on it. What the HPA should be for you, if you should have an HPA, uh, should you use Kata-based time scaling, right? And like to give you as output, not those two numbers, the requests, which are really the two numbers that you should care about, but also what should your horizontal pod scaling be and all these other factors. Um, so I know I've said a lot, but um, it, you know, that Shane now chime in maybe from his experience. I'm so glad you brought this up. Let me share some uh, scars from the field, right? There's actually two distinct problems that we're looking at here, and this is critically important. There's the one that we just talked about of bin packing a node and noting CPU utilization when you're talking at node level of bin packing is obvious why you would do that. And that's how Kubernetes thinks. But what we have to do, and this is critically important and why the Prometheus metrics you're talking about are so important, is there is a saturation metric on applications. And I would argue that is almost, it is more important. I'll just flat out say it, right? It's more important than the utilization metrics. And here's why. I want you to picture in your mind's eye for a minute an Apache application. And how would you know if you're bin packing this thing tighter or looser automatically what is the impact on the application itself? CPU can't tell you that. What would be some things that would give you a good signal, a saturation metric you could look at to know how you impacted that? Package drops, latency, if you wanted to get fancy, right? Uh, we could look at thread pool size, right? If the queues are backing up because there's just not enough threads. These are great saturation signals. And what I would warn against, and why I'm not big on the automated processes, if you're changing the bin packing and you're not looking at these saturation metrics of the application that you're bin packing, you're not only affecting that pod, but everything else on the node. Why? Because when you change that C group, all other busy containers, not every container, but busy container gets impacted by that data. And so all of a sudden, if you're not looking right? Oh, how did I impact the saturation of every application on that node? You'll be like, man, I, I just been packed this really tight, pat yourself on the head and think it's great. And you've really messed stuff up. Ask me how I know about how that happened. <laughs> you've had some scars there. We all do. Yes. So <clears throat> I wonder, I, I wonder why, you know, a lot of times um, that we, we do this after the application has already been deployed. Uh, it feels like we should be looking at um, the performance characteristics of 
the application during the development phase um, where we should uh, be like profiling our application um, and using the information from that to set the appropriate uh, resource requests and, and limits. Um, I know it's not re directly related to KRR, but I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts, Natan, about um, why, um, why we're not doing this earlier in the development cycle, why we're waiting until the application is deployed and running in the cluster. Yeah, so it's it's a fantastic question, and I'm just changing my background to make it bigger. <laughs> That's annoying. I apologize about that. So I think the the issue here is this organizational issue, and it's so it's 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 kind of about DevOps and platform teams. And I, I actually <laughs> I didn't think we'd get into this today, but there's this there's been like the original DevOps movement, right? Sorry, you have to go back before that. You have to go to when I first got started writing software, right? And back in the day, it was just that, that Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, right? And you got some machine somewhere, some physical machine, or sometimes like a VPS, like on um, Udaddy or whatever, right? And you like deploy software to that VPS. And um, back then, like in big companies, what happened was is you'd have a developer who would develop something, and you'd throw it over the wall to the ops team. And then the ops team would take it, and they would run it. And then along came DevOps movement, right? And you build it, you run it. And um, for a bit, that worked, right? But then stuff started, it started happening as an industry is it became, you build this application. So imagine you're building a car, right? And then you're going to run it. So you can drive that car to work. But you're also going to build infrastructure. And you're also going to build the road and pave the road in which you're driving that car. And then you're also going to put up the signposts for what's the speed limit. And then you're also going to install the guardrails on the side of the highway, right? And it turned out that when you were looking at deploying modern applications, then we want like a real lot of stuff. Like if you're looking at a modern Kubernetes platform, I'm doing all the scaling, right? Um, doing uh, health checks. I have self-healing applications, right? That can come back up if they go down. There's all this stuff over there. And I have to know about security. I have to know. There's all this stuff that we're getting. The applications that we're building, the business requirements are much bigger business requirements than we had back in the 80s, right? In the 70s, in the 80s, even in the 90s, no one was expecting you to auto scale your application, right? You got a whole wave of traffic, your site, you got, um, what was it? Uh, uh, stash dotted, was it, what was it called? That site back in the day that used to bring down all your traffic. Was it stash dot? Am I remembering that right? Slash dot? I don't know. Something like that. So you yeah. got a whole bunch of traffic and your site would go down or you were on the front page of Acre News and your site would go down. You, no one expected you to auto scale your application, right? You had to go and mess around like the WordPress site. Uh, WP cash, whatever, right? Um, so today, if you look at what we're expecting from people, then we have a lot of requirements. We have a lot of business requirements. And now you say that developer, you build it, you run it, you build the platform, you set up the Kubernetes nodes, you set it, you handle the security, you handle that. And there's a lot of stuff. And then we're adding on one more thing to that. And we're saying, okay, and you're also going to know the exact request for your applications. And if you now imagine a guy who's been like developing job applications um, it, since the 90s, like, Okay, put it on the server, give it a server with two CPUs. That's fine, right? Like uh, my application, like I can run it in my application, or we'll see a few more threads depending on the server, right? But there's been this huge shift. So there's all these things that now we expect developers to do. And I don't think it's realistic, um, certainly not an enterprise company, to go to developers who already have all these things on them and then say, okay, now you have one more thing that you have to do. So what ends up happening is a DevOps engineer goes, um, I know that's a bit of a misnomer, but a DevOps engineer goes to um, a developer and he says, um, okay, you're going to run this application on Kubernetes. You have to set a CPU request and a memory request. And the developer says to the DevOps guy, okay, well, you're the expert, so what do I put there? And the DevOps guy says, well, it's your application. I'm going to put whatever it needs. And the developer goes, all right, what's in four CPUs and 16 gigabytes of RAM? And then you wonder when your cluster has 10% utilization and you're paying for 10 times as much cloud as you actually need. Um, it, and it's not even that you're paying for too much cloud, you, you, you're paying for the wrong type of cloud. Maybe you need more memory and you're paying for the CPU instead. So one of the big things too is like these applications don't come with a name tag. Hi, here's my saturation metric that right. you need to know that something's happening bad. And it's hard to find and it's different. Like a Redis doesn't work like a web app versus a Spark job. And all that telemetry is data new. And so you imagine 
you know, you're coming into metric and monitoring for the first time and you've got to make wrappers on your application for both the tracing and the metrics. It's very overwhelming to people. So it's kind of easier to just slide that all under the rug and you think, well, enough people use utilization. That's got to be right. And it's not. And, you know, uh, uh, typically you got to be a little farther wrong on your journey before that bites you. And then you, you, you find out, well, OK, maybe I should double down and really learn that stuff. Yeah, 100 percent. Like yeah. if you. Sorry, go on. Go oh, ahead. no, no. Well, I was going to ask another question, but finish your thought. No, if you look at it, if you look at everything with Kubernetes, if you look at what platform engineering is about, if you look at why we, look, I did something crazy, right? I'm working at a great job. Um, I was at a company that got acquired. Um, I had all the incentives to stay there, to wait for all my options to vest after an acquisition, right? And I quit everything I was doing, and I went and I started a startup. <laughs> and I worked out of a garage, and... I got married um, about a year later and like we have a kid now and like you traded in some sense, right? Stable income for, um, for an adventure, which is a great adventure, but it's insane if you look at it in the face of it. But the, the reason I did that is because I was that developer who oh. was that apps guy and he was saying to me, I was working at a company that was dealing with Kubernetes and they're saying to me like, okay, we'll set this. And I'm looking at the application. I want to, okay, what's the right things I should be looking at? What's the dashboard? Right. I'm digging through stuff and I'm trying to figure out the Grafana dashboard. And at the end of the day, I'm still trying to write code. And if I have to write code and I have to do all that, well, guess which one I'm actually judged on and which one I'm not going to really do. Right. I'm going to write the code. <laughs> yeah. So then you have a mess in production. And I just felt like there's, there's this huge issue because everyone is looking at this and saying like, okay, you need observability data, you need tracing data, you need this. Yes, you need all that. What you need more than anything else, especially in an enterprise company, is you need expertise to interpret it. And then the question is, how can we, using software solutions, give you not just more data, all the data is there in your Prometheus. How can we give you the expertise? How can we tell you, highlight for you what you should be looking at? Right. Um, so I hope that at least like we're on the right path. We're still at the beginning, but I hope um, with what we're doing with Robusta, and especially today with KR, that we're on the right path, like shining a flash, flashlight on the right stuff everyone can look at yeah. to try and solve that pain point. Yeah. So it seems like uh, developers are overwhelmed with the amount of things that they, they have to do that uh, they often don't have time to look at the uh, performance characteristics of their application. Um, they, you know, use assumptions um, or past experience to determine you know, the best amount of resources to allocate to uh, their containers. Um, and KRR seems to at least uh, help uh, adjust those uh, according to metrics, observed metrics. Um, I'm curious if you could talk about the, the metrics that KRR uses uh, to set uh, the appropriate requests and limits. Uh, from what I recall, um, it's using uh, container CPU usage seconds total and container memory working set bytes. Um, why are those good metrics for um, setting CPU uh, and memory? So <laughs> two reasons. One, they're universally available. When we looked at this, we said um, most Kubernetes clusters that have um, Prometheus set up have three things installed. Like, there are three exporters that are almost always there. One, the node exporter. Two, um, C advisor. And sometimes C advisor is inside Kubelet, sometimes not. And three, this one isn't always present, but it's often present, cube state metrics. So we said everything we're doing, it has to work if you just run like brew install KRR, or you run uh, git clone KRR, right? And you just run it and you have this historical data, it has to work. So we have to work based on whatever historical data that like 99% of people already have if they have permits. So that limited our options, but it turns out that they're also really good metrics to look at. Like what you want to do, Really fundamentally, like if we're looking at kind of level one for how sophisticated you can be, like the least sophisticated thing you can do is you can open up a graph in Grafana and you can say, I'm going to look at this graph and I'm going to eyeball it. And I'm going to look at what was my average, or what was my maximum CPU usage? Like if I look at the spikes, like 99% of the time, what's the devil that I was underneath? And I'm going to set that as my CPU request. Um, and if you do that, then the Grafana dashboard that you're looking at uses that exact metric that we use. And if you go to memory and you look at memory, you say, I'm going to take the maximum amount of memory because memory is non-compressible. So like with 
with memory, you can't like use it. Like you can't, um, with memory, once you use a certain amount of memory, the operating system can't take it back from you without killing your application. So, so with memory, it's more important that you like set an up with limit. That's right. So for memory, we're going to take the maximum and then you're going to look at your dashboard in Grafana. You're going to eyeball it. And you're going to say, I'm going to take the maximum over the cost of the use. And then add on, let's say, a little bit of a buffer, 5%. So pro tip on this, while we're talking about this, pick the metric and C advisor that you like are actually going to look at. Cause there's like eight on memory, for example, and you pick one that you want, whatever that happens to be tune out everything else. It, uh, C advisor is the number one killer of Prometheus is in production. Like what will happen is as you scale out, you'll go from like six to 10 million metrics. And usually this is happening when things are under duress and you crash everything. So the thing that you need to troubleshoot, the thing that you need to scale ends up crashing when you need it most. Uh, I can't tell you just by tuning out, you know, that like things that you're not actively using or maybe like fully uh, understand, you know, taking out those top end metrics and Prometheus can avoid a dramatic disaster in production. So just, just a Shane, we have to do a whole separate session on Prometheus tuning, <laughs> but um, so I think this is a, a great segue into the, the demo. Um, wondering if you'd give us a, you know, uh, a quick run through of uh, KRR and how you could use it to um, extract uh, these metrics and also to you know, set the appropriate requests and, and limits for containers. And I think uh, Carlos, uh, Carlos uh, Santana uh, asked a question about when, when we're going to get to the demo. So here, here we are. So I actually, guys, I have a dirty secret here. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I think I actually, the cluster in my local cube context might not be an EKS cluster. I'm not going to say whose it is. Um, I should have set that up properly, so I'm going to apologize in advance. I don't know if the cluster is going to show up anywhere. Yeah, same concept. Yeah. Um, okay. Work, work no differently. It's the same concept. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Um, we actually run that. Um, we actually run that, um, to EKS. Um, it, so except for one environment that still is on GK. We actually run on EKS now. So um, sure. the shame I didn't get the right demo set up for this. Um, so this is the GitHub repo. And there are two ways you can run this. So the first way you run this, and sorry, you have to scroll down a bit because we have a bunch of screenshots. Um, but the first way you run this is you just do uh, install with brew on Mac. Um, soon we're going to have, I believe, a chocolatey for Windows. Um, and then the second way you can run this if you don't have a Mac or you don't want to use Brew, you just clone the GitHub repo. Um, you just clone the GitHub repo and then you run like pip install and then you run with Python. So that's what I'm going to do. I already have it cloned. Um, and I joked before um, in the prep for this actually that like we can't, you're not going to have a real long session here because it takes about 20 seconds to run, maybe 40 seconds, depending on the size of your cluster. So that's all I'm going to do here Python 3.9, krr.py. Um, and simple, that's the name of the strategy. And we're adding on more strategies soon. And this is just connecting to my cluster. Um, and it's connecting to Prometheus. So it found Prometheus automatically. So it saw in the cluster, there's a Prometheus and it found the identification of this. This is, I believe, uh, Prometheus. When you install Robusta, not KRR, but like our other open source project, um, it, then you can install it with Prometheus enabled if you want like an all-in-one monitoring solution for Kubernetes. Yep. Um, so that's just the open source project. And oh, that's it. So here are the results. Nice. And, and I, I saw you ran this on demand. Uh, is, is that intentional instead of like continually running in the background? So we have a mode where it continually runs in the background. So if I jump over here to like, um, this is the Robusta um, SaaS platform, which for all the enterprise people on the call, we also do on-prem installations. Um, but this is our commercial offering. Um, which has a heavy free tier, I should mention. Um, so don't let the word commercial scare you away. You'll probably be on the free tier. Um, so what we do here is here we actually run in the background um, and you can rescan it on demand if you want, but we also run it once a week. Um, and then you always can go in here and see the latest recommendations. But I wanted to start with this just to show that like, the, this is the pure open source version. And then the second way to get it uh, periodically is with the robust uh, um, SaaS platform. But then the third way to get it periodically, just with open source stuff, is if you use the other Robusta um, observability platform, the open source part, that you can also get a free report in Slack. 
Okay. Um, and then the idea would be to um, apply the recommendations that KRR generates um, to your uh, manifests, be they stored in, in source control, like Git, for example, um, or deployed through a pipeline. That's right. So we don't modify stuff in your cluster because in the real world, um, you really shouldn't be going out and modifying your cluster. So we don't want to encourage you to do that. Um, we want you to take the recommendation and then to set it. Right. Um, well, and you also lose the source of truth, right? The source of truth is no longer in the Git repository if, uh, say, VPA is changing the uh, CPU and, and memory allocation. Yeah. So my, I think my bone here with the C, with the VPA is um, back when we were looking at how we can implement this and stuff, we actually spoke to a whole lot of people who are using the VPA, and what we heard from almost everyone is. Um, use the VPA in recommendation only modes. We don't apply the VPA in like in automatic oh, mode. Yeah, yeah. And then when we started developing robust, we said, okay, like everyone we've spoken to, or like seven out of eight people that we've spoken to has said, I actually don't want to do automat automatically apply stuff to the cluster. So we said, okay, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna leave that out at least for now. Yeah. Now I know th this is this is opening a can of worms, and you're free to. Uh, defer or deflect the, the question if you want, but I see that, you know, you're not recommending uh, setting CPU limits. Um, and so why, why is that? Yeah. So it's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit. Of a <laughs> um, so I'll, 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 I should explain for, uh, I'll, I'll explain. So if you go to Google um, and you like search here for like um, CPU limits, Kubernetes, right? Then the top post here is something I wrote on for the love of God, stop saying CPU limits. So I've written them out, but why I'm against them. And then there are other opinions here, and there are other, other opinions that are valid. And I actually wrote, show in the second, you modify the source code um, for, for KRR. It's fairly simple how you, know, you can modify the source code if you want to give you recommendations for, um, for with limits. And you're, anyone is welcome to open a PR. We, will, we want to keep the default to no limits. But you want to add a parameter with that limits as well. And it's an optional parameter you can opt into. We have no objection to that. You have to meet people where they are. And if you want to set limits, I'm not going to, like, I shouldn't say I'm not going to tell you what to do because I, I mean, I've written the number one post on Google that has gotten me a lot of love and a lot of hate on saying you shouldn't set limits. So but I don't want to force anyone to do something. Like, there is no one true way, um, there are just different practices and different approaches. I think that's the right thing to do. And, and let me just throw my two cents on why I think that is. Um, first off is, you know, you're running at a certain rate and you run a garbage collection process that only runs every hour or something like that. Those threads in Java, you know, if it goes and creates 96 threads, that number is going to go through the roof overnight. No one can tell you what to set these values at if they don't know the number of threads in the application if they don't know the number of CPU, there is no way for anyone to know those values. You have to see them in Prometheus and you have to have some kind of understanding of when I showed that metric at that particular time. And what's dangerous about this is limits work in a hundred millisecond period. So now you're comparing it to something that runs in seconds, right? So you need to adjust for that. Now, you know, both Natan and I have a lot of blog post on this type of stuff, but it is a little brain damagey. And there's one thing that's coming in the future. The Linux kernel now is doing burst values uh, in, for limits that has not made its way down to us in Kubernetes land yet, but it's coming like that stuff takes a while. So uh, I think limits will get more popular when that kind of finally hits and stuff. But for right now, unless you read one of these blog posts, you really understand those metrics and you know what to set it for please um, hold off on that unless you're doing some kind of multi-tenant work or something where, you know, these things are really, a bad actor is really going to be impactful because it's just so easy to shoot yourself in the foot with this stuff. Yeah, you raise a really good point. Uh, I mean, there are runtimes like like Java, which are notorious for consuming uh, more more resources on startup uh, than they do uh, during steady, steady state. Um, and having that, you know, bursting capability would, would be useful. But um, I'm also wondering, like, about the, um, uh, about the granularity of the data that KRR is using yes. 
to make these recommendations. Uh, Natan, can you talk a little about that? So one that we, we let you control it. So there is a, we set a default, but then we also let you control that. So one of the interesting things is um, if you're looking at, like, let's say you ask a question, like, okay, what's the average, sorry, what's the maximum CPU usage um, last hour, right? That question is actually incomplete. You're going to get different answers depending on what granularity you're looking at. So if you're looking at five-minute granularities, then you might say that the maximum is one CPU. But if you dive into that five-minute period and you take like 10-second granularity, then actually you're going to see maybe within that five-minute period, it was like a spike way up to 10 CPUs and then down and did nothing the rest of the time. And then on the average, within five minutes, you actually had one CPU. So like when you're looking at the maximum the whole, on that whole hour, then you're going to think the maximum is one. And then you set like a CPU uh, limit um, or a request in the limit of one. And then if, especially if you're setting your limit, when you actually spike up, now you're capped at one. So that also ties into a little bit on why we recommend not setting limits. Um, but what's interesting is that there's like, the question is almost in a sense incomplete. Um, you can't say what was the maximum CPU last hour. You have to say what was the maximum CPU last hour if I'm looking at five minute intervals. And that's like a really subtle difference, but um, you end up with different numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, just one last thing on this point, because I think this is important. Once you have this data, once you know the average utilization at the high watermark for these particular apps, checking what else is running on the node at the same time. And if it's bursty and needs that, putting bursty stuff is good. You can bin pack a little tighter than you normally would. But the trap that I see people fall into that are a little new to this stuff is they'll use a great tool, right? Uh, you know, like this, but then they won't consider what else is running on the node. They'll just kind of really focus in on that one application. And that can be very dangerous when you're not thinking about, you know, if you got a hundred threads running here and a hundred threads right next door running it, like you can get some problems if you bin pack, oh, you know, forget just two, let's do 10 of those. There's gonna be a problem at some point. Yeah, so uh, Shane, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Oh, uh, yes. and, and if, if you're not comfortable answering, it's totally fine. But um, like, what if what if you're using a cluster auto scale like Carpenter and you're not controlling the bin packing yourself? Uh, I you're, think you're basically that, delegating that to, you know, Carpenter. Right. So where Carpenter excels is it uses much less uh, calls to the EC2 control plane. So spinning up nodes is great where I think you can get into trouble with high performance application. Remember, that's my jam, right? If you're just doing some basic stuff, you don't have to worry about this type of stuff. But when you're doing high, what you don't wanna do with runtimes that are dynamically allocating threads, let's say like a Java, that if I see 96 cores, I'm gonna run a garbage collection on all 96 cores. If I start swapping out an eight core box, a 96 core box, a four core box, those runtimes are going to say, oh, I'm going to create X amount of OS threads. When you start doing that, that can cause a lot of chaos really quick. My advice for you is to check two things, right? One is keep in the same family of CPU numbers if you're using dynamic runtimes, right, that are looking at that OS or set like a GoMax prox or, you know, make life a little bit easier because you got to think of stuff on the node level right. and metric and all that stuff, um, I don't want to belabor that point too much, uh, Jeremy, but I hope that just answers that quickly. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll tie that back into KR. Like right now, if we're looking yeah. at this, right? I'm running this here and I'm using the simple strategy. The more we get into this and the more we like look at this, it's not like we're going to need a lot more than just the simple strategy. This is all, of course, also an area where we want contributions. Um, but like if you're looking at Java applications, Java applications do behave actually a little bit differently. And if I get back to what I said at the beginning about like where we're trying to take this with KRR, then you're recommending resources for Java and Kubernetes. Really, you also want to be recommending some of the JVM settings alongside that. So we're not there yet, but I can imagine having a, like a strategy here called Java that knows how to output not just the CPU and request, but some Java specific stuff. Like, the, and, like Java options and heap size and things like that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. One thing cool. to remember when you're doing that on that topic specifically is Java lets you set the thread pool sizes, but it doesn't hide the underlying containers, nothing in the C groups function. So it will still use 
or it will try to use, but if you reduce the thread pool, the damage is just a little bit less, but there's like some nuances. And I, I think, you know, to your point, Natan, is knowing a little bit about the runtime that you're working with goes a long way. And this exciting thing that you were doing is you open up the universe of like, I can get any Prometheus metric that I want, even if it's a little brain damaging to do a lot of that work with. Yeah, so it, it comes back to why I quit my job, <laughs> right? Like you can't, I probably spent more talking about uh, I mean, Kubernetes CPU limits than anyone else in the world with a possible, probably with the exception of Tim Hocken at Google, right? Um, so but with the exception of Tim Hocken, I probably spent more talking about this than anyone else. And yet, um, if you look at why I've written, it doesn't have a lot of up-to-date information on Java because I still don't feel that I understand it well enough. And one of these days, I, I, I'm going to, like, I'm slowly putting together your thoughts in a version two of that post, and I'm going to have something to take into account Java. But the expertise, like the level of expertise here that we're expecting from people who want to right size a job application is not so easy, right? So what we want to do, and like it comes back again to like what we're trying to do with tools like this is what we want to do is we want to capture expertise as code. What we want is we want to ultimately have here um, just the word Java here. And I want to get, what's his name? Uh, the guy at Microsoft, uh, Bruno's um, or Borges. I'm thinking on his name right now. But there's a guy at Microsoft who's fantastic and really has like the best. Yes. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, he's amazing. Yeah, I. that's where I learned what I just said from was that gentleman, yeah. Yeah, he has a fantastic, fantastic talk. And I want to get him to write this Java strategy. And then <laughs> anyone in the world who is running Java applications in Kubernetes can run one command and we've taken the expertise and we've turned the expertise into just like a software as like a software solution. Because otherwise, as you look at the amount of expertise that you need, like even just look at the CNCF landscape, the amount of expertise that people need to run stuff in production over time is just going way up and it's blowing up exponentially. But human expertise does not grow exponentially. So our, my goal and my hope with KRR is that at least for one aspect here for the resource recommendations and for everything related to Kubernetes resources, and right sizing, we can capture all that expertise like, in code. And I want to maybe transition now. So I want to just explain what you're seeing here in the table, if that's okay. Sure. And then I'll jump into the code for a bit. Yeah. Um, so I ran this on the cluster and I ran it with no parameters, but there are a bunch of parameters if you want to tune it. And I just see here the cluster and I see the namespace and the name of the um, application. And I should say workload, right? Not application, but name of the workload, the type that's a deployment. It could be a daemon set, could be a standalone pod, could be whatever. Um, the number of pods, the number of old pods is um, a stuff that's not running right now, but that we're pulling into the history. And you see, I have a relatively new cluster here, actually with all that um, historical stuff. And here are the container, which container we're recommending, right? People sometimes don't realize this, but you're actually setting some requests and limits on a container basis, not a pod basis. Um, and here I have um, just the CPU request. This is the current value, so this is unset. And based on historical data, it should be 11M. Um, and then this is 180M, and we don't have enough data to give a recommendation there, so we're not giving it, right? This is 50M, and it could be 5M. So we have the stuff here where we're giving the recommendations. In this case, here's uh, running KubeWatch, which is another open source project we maintain, and it's running with 10M, and we think it should be 18M. Um, that's me the course um, for me the CPU. And then for the limits, like I said, we recommend that you don't set them. Um, but we are open to PRs that add on that like set them as 1.2%, let's say, of the request to make that a parameter. Um, we just won't change the default on that because we don't think it's right um, for most people. And then for the memory request, again, what should the memory request be? And then for the memory limits, we are setting limits. We are setting request levels then to avoid over provisioning with memory. Um, and the algorithm for this is actually really simple. Um, the algorithm is just look at the historical data for CPU, take the 99th percentile. And for memory, um, you just take the maximum and add on 5%. So like if you eyeballed it, if you open up Grafana and you like look at the historical memory and then you like calculate it yourself, this is exactly what you would do. 
You know where this is extremely important is in daemon sets, um, especially in larger clusters. Guys, I see like 11 daemon sets and they're never quite right sized or ever looked at. Like people don't think that as a first class citizen. And since it's on every node, like when you do a thousand nodes, it's one of the biggest defenders that I see. So I could see this being especially great for things like, you know, getting those daemon set settings, you know, perfect. So right? it's actually, we're working on that. The team is working on that this sprint. Not on daemon sets, but when we do the severity and we show you what's high priority, what's low priority, right? Oh. And we're doing colors here, but when we do, like this is colored red because it's the biggest change. But when we look at the priorities, we're not gonna do the priority based on the absolute difference here. We're gonna do the priority based on the absolute difference multiplied by the number of odds that I've ran. Mm, right, that right. It's so kind of like a weighted thing. Yeah, it's not actually the number of pods because it's also how long they ran, but multiplied by like the impact. Awesome. Um, Natan, I don't know if, if you've gone so far as to um, extrapolate like the cost savings that you would derive if you implemented all of these recommendations, but do you have like a rough approximation? Um, or this is primarily trying to optimize uh, the resources and not really looking at how that translates to cost. So we want to we want to help translate to cost because that's what people care about ultimately when they decide also what to prioritize. Um, like you care about two things when you're if you're under provisioned, then you care about reliability, right? If you're under provisioned, then you're going to have a bad day. Or if you had um kills, we're doing something now that we'll also look at like um, um kills and we'll look at uh, CPU throttling and then take those into account when we give the recommendation. Say like we're giving this recommendation because you were um killed last week. Um, so we're taking that into account. So that's on like when you're under provisioned. And then when you're over provisioned, the number one thing you care about is the cost. So I see Carlos actually guessed what we're planning. Yeah, right. The Carlos, Carlos asked about cost. the open cost, yeah. The team at KubeCost and OpenCost have done a fantastic, fantastic job um, doing an open source project that maps um, like this sort of stuff to a dollar amount. Um, so we've considered doing the integration there. I mean, it's something that we're interested in, I think, would too. Be really cool to do. Um, we haven't done it yet, but it's on their own map. Okay. Um, I, I, I have to ask this question because we were talking about VPA earlier. Um, in, in Kubernetes 1.27, um, there's an alpha feature called uh, in place resource resize for Kubernetes pods. Um, I wanted to get your your thoughts about that. I see Shane is smiling. I can already tell that he has uh, strong opinions. Um, about this, but I'm wondering if, like, how you're thinking about KR may utilize this this feature in the in the future. So, two things. Um, one, the more we get into, and the more we look at recommendations, also, the more we realize it's like stuff is complicated. Um, like, if you look at if you look at also like recommending how you're going to recommend an HPA based on historical data, right? Like, it's there's actually a lot of stuff that you're taking into account. So. The first answer is it's com it's complicated. I don't have the answer just yet because the trivial solutions don't always do exactly what you think would be a good idea. And then the second thing is um, that's the Kubernetes like alpha feature that I'm the most excited about more than anything else since ephemeral containers. So we are going to figure it out. Um, I just don't have a full answer yet. And Shane, maybe you want to chime in? Oh yeah. So I find this concept fascinating because in my mind, look. Let's take an Envoy pod, right? You're, you're doing like some type of gateway and you're running to an Envoy router. There is a certain vertical scale that every application has. And it's only one thing to where it starts to tip over and it's something bad. And if you set that too low, you end up creating pod after pod after pod after pod and you get these unnecessary scaling problems. It is not uncommon for me to go into like an Istio account or something and someone's got 50 Envoys when they needed two. And so I think what's going to the unintentional flow down effect of this is people are going to start resizing these pods constantly. And it's when you only they're going to use that as a crutch instead of testing the right vertical scale and end up creating it's going to pour gasoline on the fire of this existing problem of you get all these unnecessary scaling problems, because if I have 50 pods where I only needed five you're putting pressure on the kublet in the entire system. And all of a sudden, now you have a whole new set of problems that you didn't have to do it before. And now you, you uh, are just resizing in place. What's going to end up happening is you're not going to see that in the way that you used to see it. Because it used to cause a lot of control plane contention. And this resize in place 
those threads are all going to sit on a run queue waiting on each other and it's going to constantly change. And you're going to wonder why, why, why is the latency so bad on this? It's got to be those network people again. And you're going to be <laughs> down at the network people for it's like, always uh, the network. yes, of network, course. network or DNS. Yeah. Right? yeah. And yeah. I, I, if I look at my crystal ball. I can see that happening in the future. And Jeremy, I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, Carlos for the kind words and saying so interactive here in the chat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if other people uh, on the stream have questions, feel free to put them into the chat. Um, we're here to answer your questions. I mean, we, we, uh, we of course, have a list of, of questions that uh, we're trying to get through, but uh, we'd love to be able to take your questions. I'll, I'll repeat why I always say there are no stupid questions. There are only stupid answers. <laughs> so whatever the question, feel free. I mean, that's what we're here for. Um, so, you know, as we're waiting for another question to come in, um, I'll, I'll ask a, another question. Um, how do you see KRR working with uh, continuous profiling agents like uh, Parka or Prodfiler, for example? Because uh, continuous profiling feels like it's become the like the fifth pillar of observability. Um, yep. And so I'm just wondering like how you're looking at uh, incorporating data from continuous profilers or whether that's even important uh, for setting things like requests and limits. So what? Uh it's not in the immediate plans. Um, I'm sure there are interesting things we can do there, but I'll explain why it's not in the immediate plans. Um, I think it's a different, like you wake up in the morning with a different goal when you're looking at a profiler and when you're running KRR. You wake up in the morning to run KRR when you have to fill in that number, right? Like the DevOps guy said to you, um, okay, you have to put in the CPU request, you have to put in the memory request or someone from the FinOps team said, okay, we have clusters with 10% utilization. You gotta fix that by next week, right? Like we're not gonna pay for all that anymore when it's unused. And you, that, that's when you wanna run KRR, right? Or when, you wanna, or when you're done with the free credits um, and now you wanna like start running your applications and you have to actually pay for the CPU that they're using. And then you want on the, on the flip side of that, and you wanna run a continuous profiler, when you wake up in the morning and someone says to you, like your application is using, is actually using like four CPUs in production, that's not efficient. Or when someone says to you, okay, your application is like maxing out at, like a hundred simultaneous HTTP requests, we need to support more than that. And that's when you want to look at the continuous profiler and then understand what's going on under the hood. So if you're trying to fix the application, you can't use KRR because like we're looking at it from a black box, we're not looking inside your application. Right. But on the other hand, if you want to set the request in the limit, well, it doesn't help to know that like which part of your code is inefficient because you're not going to go at that exact moment in time. And like, you're not going to go and change the code just to set the, the request number. Right, right, right. You, know, you have to go and you have to set the request cycle. So I think it's two different like jobs to be done. Yeah, Jeremy, uh, if I could weigh in on this too. Yeah. Uh, my, my hero, Michael Hausenblas, kind of got me turned on to, you know, these continuous profilers and I'm a big fan. I see this as three distinct phases that we go through in like rolling out an application. There's the profiler, like, do I have a mutex, right, that I coded wrong and I'm getting a lot of latency or the concurrency set wrong or something like that. I'm going to catch that in a profiler, right? Then I go find that perfect vertical scale for the app, right? And I, I put that out and I do testing with just that pod on just that node and I, I get that data. Now I move into the KRR universe where, you know, what is that application acting when it's on a node with all other things? Like, what does that look like? And then finally I go to the stage of now that pod and how it interacts with everything is where we start to get into kind of the tracing and that kind of telemetry data. So I said three and I meant four. And just real quick, uh, Carlos asked real quick on, you know, should we run Prometheus outside of the cluster? I, I think you always collect the data inside of the cluster. What you export it to once you have it is, um, you know, yes, you know, export it anywhere that you want to go. But the collection, it is critically important that those collection windows happen at a rapid pace. Because um, if you're not scraping every 30 seconds, then it gets delayed. Because with time series databases, all the scrapes don't happen at the same time right? They're kind of staggered, but you need to have it very compressed. And so the closest you can get it to what you're scraping is ultra, ultra important. So never do the scrapers that aren't inside. Where, where do you send that data once it's scrapped? That's fine, right? Be that AMP or anything else. So I'll also add on here um, now from like the robust and the KRR perspective, 
Um, we don't care where you store the data. If I go back here, like um, we have on here somewhere, instructions for Google Manage Prometheus. Um, and like I know in the Robusta docs, uh, we've got something now on, um, I believe Azure Manage Prometheus as well. I know, a, I know AWS is also gonna be here soon. Um, so it doesn't matter to us where the data is stored. Um, like if I run it here and I ran it inside the cluster, it will automatically discover it. Whereas if you're gonna run it with something outside that's we're storing the data outside the cluster, then you might need to point it at that. But when we say Prometheus, then we mean Prometheus or AWS managed Prometheus or Azure managed Prometheus um, or Victoria Metrics even, right? Or Thanos or Grafana Mimir. We mean anything that looks and smells approximately like Prometheus. Um, yeah, when you're doing this stuff, there's two key considerations I'd like, you know, everyone in the audience to think about. One is, you know, if there's a problem, are you persisting that data, you know, having some type of store that it commits those blocks to so that if for whatever reason, the remote store can't keep up or has a problem, um, you know, that's something that you want to think about, right? Especially if you are doing remote metrics, like custom metrics to scale and you have APIs that need that data and that thing goes down, that is highly problematic. Like it becomes much, much more important. So making sure that that is a reliable setup and that it can recover and how it recovers are some things that you might not originally think about just to add a little extra on that topic. Yeah, so Carlos is asking there, what is, um, he has a question about AMP. Um, it, and IRSA, um, Carlos, can you maybe write in the chat, what is I IRSA? I'm not sure I'm familiar with that. Yeah, so you have to set up some certain policies, right? That it's allowed to go talk to it. You know, we wanna reduce what the nodes allow to talk to. So there are some special policies that you need to apply to do that remote right from, let's say it's Prometheus, right? To the AMP server. So that's what he's talking about. Oh, cool, I got it. Oh, um, oh hi, Waleed. See Waleed is joining in too. Um, <laughs> He gave me an orange at KubeCon. Um, nice. So I think he's just looking at the policies to be able to do that remote policy uh, to AMP, right? <laughs> and, but, I, and I think uh, Carlos is actually offering to write uh, part of your documentation. <laughs> yeah, I would love it. I, I, let me show you. The, let me show you um, <laughs> yeah, that is the way who uh, gave me an orange in Valencia, at KubeCon Valencia. I think, yeah, uh, no problem about the T-shirt. <laughs> uh, it's nice to see everyone. Uh, but, so let me just go back here. Um, so Carlos, regarding um, the docs, then we have the docs here. Um, I think the docs are getting long. Maybe we need to move over to proper docs, not the sidebar. But um, let me just search for here for uh, Google. Yeah, so some additional configuration is necessary. So just add another line here. And I think we can start off based off the, based off the page for Google Manage Prometheus. And just add the steps here. That's under docs. Um, and then it can KKR just be a consumer of that thing that I'm already grabbing those metrics out of? Like I wouldn't necessarily need it to talk to the store. I could just do it remotely off the latest scrapes potentially, right? Um, or you're looking over the history, so you'd want to go back to the remote store. Go back to the history. Yeah, that makes sense. I know with Google, like you can deploy the front, the the uh, Prometheus front end, they call it. And then with Azure, I think you have to like set up some weird auth stuff. So there's, there should be a way. I, 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 I suspect it's only a documentation issue for how to set it up. But if it turns out there's a code issue as well, um, I will say that we have, um, like here's a PR we just did, um, adding support for Thanos and Victoria Metrics. Um, I think with Thanos, the story was um, in Victoria Metrics, I think the story was you have a bunch of stuff that's um, that's not like you have one centralized Thanos, and then when you're querying, you just need to make sure that you're grabbing stuff for the right cluster. You have like a hundred clusters reporting to the same Thanos, pulling historical data, pulling historical data for your cluster. Um, so I think that was the story with Thanos. Um, so there's an example PR here that you can find on recently merged stuff also, if it does involve any code. But of course, we're on Slack, we're on the Robusta Slack, um, which I'll call out. Um, on the website, just click the biggest black button over here. Um, so people can always feel free to ask us and we'll point you in the right direction. Um, we love contributors. So Natan, we have about uh, five minutes left. 
Um, I have uh, two questions I wanted to ask you. Um, the first is what's next for KRR? And you already alluded to a few things that you're, you're thinking about, like recommendations for uh, Java options and heap, heap, configuring the heap and so forth. Um, but it'd be good to know like what, what you're thinking about um, uh, to, to evolve KRR and also like what's the best way for people to get started? Okay, so I'll start with the second question first. Um, just run it. You don't need to install anything in your cluster. You don't need to configure anything by default if you have an in-cluster Prometheus. Um, just run it and um, see see if you get ideas for how to for how to optimize your cluster. Um, so I think like I think we've we've tried really hard to make it as easy as possible to run. So if, if it's if it's hard to run or something that doesn't go right, also um, I'm Nathan Yellen on LinkedIn um, and A A N T N on Twitter. So like just message me. And I'll make sure also that someone looks into it because we want to make it really really easy. Yeah. So for I, I mean, I I can tell you that I I, I got it running on, on my cluster, so it's got to be pretty easy if I can do it. Oh, I don't know. I think you're pretty <laughs> <really> advanced. <laughs> but, <laughs> you, but okay, so so um, to get started, I would say just like try that. There's no damage. You don't need to install anything in your cluster. So um, um, look at the recommendations, see if they make sense to you. And then in terms of what we're planning, so it's three main pillars that we're looking at. The first is explainability, and I really wanted to show this today. Um, it, but we actually don't have it fully. It's, it still is in progress. We're just doing the release for it a little later today, I think. So um, what we're doing around explainability, I'll show a broken version of it. This is on our staging environment. Um, is when you click on a specific recommendation, then we're going to pull in the historical data here. And this is going to spin forever because um, it's a broken staging version. But we're going to pull in the um, historical data, and we're going to show you a, da like a dotted line with our recommendation on top of the historical data so that you can understand why we're calculating what we're calculating. Um, so the first thing is to really invest in explainability so that you understand why we're recommending what we recommend. The second pillar is around giving um, like really high quality recommendations that are more sophisticated. So the first thing there probably will be to be able to give like an HBA config as output as well, or a Kaza nice. config, um, to give it like a really, I guess, a really good example of this. Like imagine I'm opening this up and I'm looking at a graph Imagine I like um, go and I look at some application. Um, you know, let me grab some application here. Um, maybe that's pending and it's not actually running. Um, but imagine I take, oh, that's running. Okay, so imagine I take some application and I look at the CPU and memory on this and I don't see that it's a flat line. I see that there's this massive, massive amount of spikes, right? And I see that like every Monday morning, it does a ton of work and all the other time it does nothing. Well really what I want to do for that, like the optimal recommendation would be take Kada. And in Kada, there's this thing called the time-based uh, scaler. So just output as your recommendation, the Kada time-based scaler and say like scale up more on, on Mondays and the rest of the week, like have less CPU available. So the second thing we're going to do, if the first was explainability, then the second thing that we want to do is like to be able to look at this historical data and to get output richer recommendations. That's not just these two numbers, uh, the CPU request and the memory request. Well, and the limits. Um, and then the third thing that we want to do ties into reporting, um, into really how enterprises and like platform teams and developers work. So if you go here and you're looking at these recommendations, then to maybe be able to like assign it to specific people on the team or send you a notification in Slack, like you have a new recommendation that's important for whatever reason. And then I tie also like cube cost integration to reporting, right? To like really match kind of an enterprise workflow. And I think we're running out of time, so. Uh... We are, yeah. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Um, so again, I want to thank my guests, uh, Shane Corbett and Natan Yon, uh, joining me on this episode about uh, optimizing the resources assigned to your container images using KRR. Um, and uh, we'll see you all soon. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks. Thank you.